Hello everyone and welcome back to Sabres of Infinity. So in the last episode, we managed to turn around and complete our first mission. It did not go the way that we wanted it to go, but we did manage to complete it. However, shenanigans happened not too long after that. So I had some updates going on on my laptop and I actually did end up losing the save. So I did go back and replay through some things and whatnot. And as you will see, um, Darren Dahl Dracon is a little different this time around. So um, I didn't focus so much on soldiering because I actually had that a little bit confused. I was confusing, I was confusing soldiering with the actual, um, I guess the formations and everything, like actually being able to use your units and stuff like that. And that's not really how this works out. Soldiering in this particular case is your own personal valor. So that's how good you are in combat and stuff like that. So I went ahead and I did change some things. I still stayed in the same area, but I did more of a focus on charisma and intellect. I think the actual gift that I chose to um, bring with me with some books and stuff like that. And I'm also a little bit more friendlier with um, Davis De Elson, I think that's his call, and that's his name or not. Um, so yeah, I'm a lot more friendlier with him. I actually did save him during the, um, during the little mock exercise or whatever. And actually that caused Casarosa to not get a, get a brevet promotion. So I'm sure he's not too happy with me about that. So yeah, that, that changed some things right there. Then when we got to the actual battle on the, um, I think it was the victorious, if I'm not mistaken, I actually ended up leading the boarding party. We, um, I actually managed to save people before the Bane spell went off and, uh, didn't get anybody killed in that particular case. And I uh, actually got a lot of money because of that, because everything was successful and we didn't lose that many men or anything. I think two people died or something like that. Um, so of course I got some decorations for that. And then also um, in the last situation where um, we had to set the trap up um, for Major Hunter, or I think he's Captain Hunter right now, he's about to be Major Hunter. Um, I actually ended up having to do that twice because the first time I did it, uh, I tried to, to uh, pocket the seals and um, try and set it up so it would work out well. And I ended up getting killed because <laughs> it didn't go off properly or whatnot. So, and I think I wasn't smart enough to pull that off. So yeah, pain and sadness ensued and I died. So I had to go back. But yeah, I went ahead and went back. The, everything went off without a hitch. Um, the I think the only thing that messed up is that I still tried to extend the seals and it didn't work out right. So I had to go back to the original way of doing it pretty much the same way it happened um in the um last playthrough with darren dracone and uh it went off without a hitch i actually managed to turn around and set it up properly because i got the thunderer horse faith didn't seem like she did very much for me so i went ahead and just spent the money and got thunderer because i thought about it and i was also like well if i turn around and if i'm going to actually go through each situation then i really don't have a need to turn around and save money and try and get that promotion early because i'm not going to get the promotion early so i'm just going to go ahead and actually go through each thing and try and get a promotion in that situation so yeah i went ahead and bought thunderer and uh yeah thunderer has worked out well for me i turned around and led the charge because i managed to uh get the horses uh from being tired and everything and then i led the charge the prince or whatever it was, the Hussar, he was caught. And yeah, things have been very, very good for me. As you can turn around and see, I already have two decorations. I think in the first episode, you can get three. Um, I'm not sure when the last one comes through. And I think the last one is actually one that you just kind of get anyway. But, uh, but yeah, so I have two right. Well, actually, I take that back. I think there's three that you can get. And then there's one that you just universally get the three. I think you get a achievement for getting the three because you can go through the entire first game without getting all three of them. So I'm going to try and see if I can actually get all three now, but I am still a bit of a cynic. I'm trying to get to be a little bit more ruthless and then maybe I'll be able to get that in the upcoming uh, little situation or whatnot. But yeah. And also, as you can see, the discipline of my man is a lot higher um, there, well, actually it's a 40 and the morale of my men are actually fine right now. So, and I think the loyalty is fine as well. So yeah, there is that, but, uh, yeah, I did have to go ahead and change some things. So, uh, I think I'm actually caught up. Actually, hold on a second, because if I'm not mistaken, this isn't, 
Yeah, this is actually right after the situation where um, this is actually right after um, the situation with Captain Hunter and me having to set up the seals. So I'm going to go ahead and skip past the next part because the next part we've already seen this and it's just going to basically be me rehashing everything. It might be slightly different, but yeah, it's pretty much going to be the same thing. So I'll skip past all of this. Actually, you know what? Change my mind. So instead of actually going ahead and doing the same thing I did last time, I'm going to actually just go ahead and do the um, reserve duty instead. So we'll just do it in reverse this time around. Since it is kind of slightly different anyway, I'll just go ahead and request cavalry reserve duty. So let's see how that turns out. You inform Major Hunter and your men of your decision the next day. Of course, the progress has been saved. So yeah, the name is still the same. Pretty much everything is still the same. The only thing that's going to change is that instead of the um, situation where you had the men um, turning around and doing some shady stuff, this time around, I'm going to actually um, do the opposite of that. So I'm going to turn around and um, do reserve duty first. Wherein the cavalry officer rides to the relief of an outlying outpost and engages a small force of Antari in battle. And that also reminds me, I'm going to have to be careful because this time around, again, my my soldiering is a 30, so I could probably probably be OK, but I'm going to have to keep in mind that I am not the I'm not a 60. So whereas I would definitely be OK in most situations, I'm definitely going to have to be careful of that. So I'm going to have to focus on being smarter and being clever and things like that, which is the type of characters that I normally like to play as anyway. So there's that. Anywho, and also I do apologize in the last episode, um, the music was quite loud. I didn't think it was going to be that loud, but then I kind of noticed it in editing that it was pretty loud. So um, this time it's still playing, but it should be a lot lower. Shouldn't be too bad. Again, if there's any problems, just let me know and I can adjust it as well. I'm going to have to play with it a little bit, but I think it should be OK this time around. So, all right. There's no doubt that the arrival of additional cavalry units is a welcome development. You happily have your patrol assigned to the outpost's cavalry reserve. While this would require you to be ready to sortie in case of emergency, it would also allow your men to be present within the newly erected palisade and recently arrived comforts of the outpost at all other times. A welcome change from the monotony of patrol duty. With the outpost expanded into a full base of operations, the temple of life has picked up. You cannot even drop by the enlisted barracks by to check on your men without bumping into some newly arrived officer happy to establish an acquaintance. With the new faces come a new attitude and new superiors. With Sir Enrique Hunter's promotion to major, he no, no, ah, he no longer has the time to direct individual patrols. Instead, you must deal with a member of his newly appointed staff, Captain Daniel Leaf, a harsh and cynical man whose blunt and caustic manner strikes a sharp contrast with the gentlemanly Major Hunter. Over the next few weeks, the outpost expands dramatically. The, the newly arrived engineers build several wood and stone bunkhouses to shelter the new men. So this part we've already seen. We already know about this. Lansborough gets into a situation and uh, yeah, that none of this has pretty much changed. All right. You enter the office and you to see the two senior officers of the outpost standing with the Lancer you saw earlier. You report yourself ready for duty and the two Grenadier officers take you to the map table. Captain Leaf points at a dot on the map near the far side of the River Karen. As you well know, we have a listening post on the far side of the River Karen for some time now. It is a relatively crude camp with limited defenses and a very small garrison numbering perhaps a dozen. Major Hunter beckons the Lancer to approach. Only when you get closer, get a closer look, do you realize that the man's ornate uniform bears merely the insignia of a lowly non-commissioned soldier. Lance Corporal Kinsey has just ridden through the night from that camp. He has come to us with the intelligence that the listening post is under a light attack by the Antari. The garrison is holding, but it has apparently expended much of its supplies of shot and powder. The attacking force is reported to be quite sparse, but the Lancers are unsuited to fighting on foot. With the other units of, oh, excuse me, with the other units of horse on patrol, you remain the only force of cavalry available. We require your men to ride to the post with relief supplies of ammunition and assist them in dealing with any remaining assailants. 
The major looks up to you, his expression serious. This is an undertaking of grave urgency, Cornet. I will demand the greatest expediency from you. If you have any questions, ask them now. Okay, who commands the listening post? Lance Corporal Kinsey describes the few virtues and many, many weaknesses of Lieutenant Caracourt, his commanding officer, in great and bitter detail. Apparently, the man only has his commission because of powerful relatives in the courts. According to Kinsey, he is a man of unsound intelligence and, ent and entirely unsuited for any sort of combat. Most importantly, Kinsey blames him for ordering that, that the garrison stand and fight when they could have easily melted into the forest. Leaf and Hunter listen with pained expressions. You get the expression you get the expression that neither men would wish such a leader inflicted on any of the soldiers under their command. Any other questions, Cornet? What defenses does the listening post have? Major Hunter asks the Lancers for an answer. It is not an encouraging one. Lance Corporal Kinsey describes the listening post's lack of defense very su succinctly. Aside from a crude fence made from bundled branches and a few strong points composed of piled logs, more for defense from the weather than from an earnest attack, the listening post has no defensive fortifications to speak of. Any other questions? Um, why don't we send a larger relief column on foot instead? Captain Leaf shakes his head. If we send a force on foot, it would take more than a day to reach the listening post. Such a delay could leave the garrison without ammunition long enough for the entire to overwhelm them. In this case, speed trumps all other considerations. It shall have to be you. Any other questions, Cornette? No questions. Major Hunter steps forward as you finish with your questions. Very well. You're also permitted to engage any stragglers of the Antari force that remains. As such, I am making the contents of the armory available to you. Would you feel the need to augment your striking power or the abilities of the listening post's lancers? You see Captain Leaf face go sour. It is clear that Major Hunter Hunter's offer goes against the recommendations of his chief of staff. Still frowning, Leaf leads you to the squat stone armored building. You may requisition a few items from our stores if you absolutely must. Our supplies of munitions are limited, so try to avoid squandering them. You look over the weapons and supplies available to you. Uh, let's see. Well, I don't have time to actually try and train these folks. Uh, so I'm going to get extra shot and powder because I know that was one thing that they mentioned that they kind of lack. So let's go ahead and get that. You pack a saddlebag full of gunpowder and lead balls sealed in wax paper cartridges. You manage to get nearly 2000 of the things in the bag. Certainly enough for a score or so men to fight a, len a lengthy engagement. With powder and shot safely stowed, you and your men set off a little after 9 o'clock. You follow the old Imperial Highway down to the, to the Carrion River Bridge. The conditions of the road have been much improved in recent months thanks to the diligent efforts of the Royal Engineers. Potholes have been filled, large stretches have been cobbled, and the path is now wide enough to accommodate three horses riding abreast. With the monotony of riding along a good road comes a certain mental wanderlust. Your thoughts quickly turn to the situation which must await you upon arrival. From the snippets of conversation that you hear from those riding behind you, it seems your men are thinking the same thing. It seems proper that you should reassure them by telling them what they are likely to expect. You decide to tell them, hmm, to be prepared for anything. You turn in your saddle, a grim expression on your face. I won't lie to you, gentlemen. Our best intelligence is a day old, and we may even be riding into a trap. Nonetheless, we have our orders, and we must carry them out unless some good and solid reason presents itself for us not to. The king expects us to carry on, and carry on we shall. The men are not reassured in the least, and the remainder of your journey passes in a miasma of anxiety and fee and fear. So yeah, I might have a bit more charisma, but it doesn't save me from all situations. Okay, as the sun finally begins to sink towards the western edge of the summer sky, you spot the deforested hill upon which your destination stands. As you venture closer, you begin to see the signs of a fight. A body or two sprawled on the road and a few trees scorched with some sort of minor bane casting. All is silent as you announce yourself to the garrison of the listening post. 
You hear a sharp crack as something fast and metal passes by your head. You turn in time to see a musket ball smack into the trunk of a tree before you, before disappearing in a cloud of splinters. One of your men gives a sudden cry as he points into the forest. You follow his arm to see a handful of dark shapes and the glint of a sun of sun on metal. It seems the Antari have not been beaten back after all. More begin pouring out of the forest, muskets at the ready as you and your men spur your horses and make for the listening post at a hard gallop. Jesus. Thankfully, the Antari, for all their numbers, are terrible shots. You and your dragoons manage to reach the makeshift wall of the listening post without suffering a single hit. The enemy continue to charge after you as, you patro as your patrol stands trapped. The fence is too high to jump over, and you can see no entrance otherwise. The Antari get closer, and your men begin returning fire with their carbines. One of the enemy musketeers goes down, but another quickly grabs his weapon and takes his place. A half a dozen ready their weapon as you and your men make to draw your sabers. More lead balls whiz past your head, this time going the other way. Two more Antari are struck down. The remainder turn and run for the forest. You twist in the saddle to see eight heads poking above the fence, each wearing the distinctive high caps of the White Rose Lancers. One of the Lancers pushes open a section of fence, clearly designed to be used as a sort of gate. With the way now clear, you and your men walk your horses inside. The listening post is very little more than a small enclosure inside the fence. Its only real structures are three tents, a latrine pit, a small and a small wooden shed half dug into the ground for the storage of supplies and weapons. A wide lean to made of woven of oh excuse me. A wide lean to made of we of woven branches serves as a primitive stable. You and your men hit your mounts to the crudely carved posts. As you finish tying up your horses, you are met by a man wearing sergeant stripes. Despite his haggard appearance and stocky build, his uniform somehow makes him look more elegant than your entire unit combined. Saints look down on us with pity, he proclaims, the relief evident in his voice. Kinsey got through. Tell me, what news do you bring? How many men has Major Hunter sent in after you? Who's commanding them? His face seems to collapse when you tell him that no other help would be forthcoming. With a grim expression, he orders his men to begin unloading the supplies which you've brought. Bloody excellent, that is. We were hoping for a relief column, a real one. More than that, we were hoping for a higher officer to take the reins from our pig arse of a, of a commander. <laughs> the sergeant fills you in on the situation. The Antari had attacked on the night before in a group of about half a dozen. When that small force retreated, they had thought that the attackers had been driven off. Kinsey had been sent to request more supplies. Unfortunately, that morning, the Antari had returned in a band of 30 or 40. The post has been under constant attack ever since. Worst is that idiot Caracourt thinks that we can outlast them. He sees no reason not to just sit here while we run out of food and powder. The second we fire our last shot, the Antari will come in with torches and burn this whole mess down around our ears. The sergeant points accusingly at a man sitting in the shadow of the largest tent. The subject of the sergeant's irie seems oblivious to his ah, subordinate's harsh criticism. Serenely cutting up his dinner with a silver knife and fork, a pistol and saber lie discarded beside him, and he seems to be paying very little heed to the dire situation around him. There's the jackass right there. He won't listen to us, but maybe he'll take some wiser counsel than his own from another officer. Caracourt looks even more like a twit up close than he did from afar. His wax mustache and immaculately cared for uniform would make him seem out of place anywhere save for perhaps at a high class salon. You wait impatiently, holding your salute as he slowly takes a sip from his wine glass and finally acknowledges your presence. What is it, Sirrah? Can you not see I am irrevocably occupied? He exclaims without even looking up. It is only after you clear your throat that he realizes that he is addressing a fellow officer and not one of his enlisted men. If you've come from the main post, Sirrah, you may tell Lord Wolfswood that our position is quite satisfactory and that I shall not need to be pestered by further visits. Oh, he, oof, he definitely sounds like a jackass. Okay, 
<laughs> your momentary confusion at the unfamiliar name is dispelled once you realize that the lieutenant is using Major Hunter's noble title as if your commanding officer's military rank meant less than his standing in the courts. It has become abundantly clear just how lightly Karakort takes his duties as a king's officer. You decide then and there that this moron will surely get all his men killed. He must be dealt with. That I will not stand this idiot for any longer. I will take my men and leave as soon as possible. No, I'm not going to do that. You attempt to explain the wisdom of either withdrawing from the listening post or otherwise taking some sort of drastic action, but it seems that Karakort's mind is set on its idiotic on this idiotic course. No matter how persuasive or even intimidating you get, the fool refuses to budge. You bite back a reply for as long as you can until you can stand the man no further. You open your mouth and spit a repulse, sharp and venomous. Um... Uh, if you insist on leading your men to your deaths, then my men shall not detain you. F then my men shall not detain you further. I shall take my leave of you. You may wish to die, sir, but your men do not deserve to die with you. If we stand and fight with you, we shall stand some chance. Lieutenant Caracourt, you are a disgrace to his majesty's army. Since you seem so uneager to save your men, I shall have to do it for you. I am assuming command. Oh yeah, I'm just going to take it. Just take it. Karakort stands angrily, spilling his wine over his folding table. How dare you, sirrah? This is my command. But what right does a cornet of barely cavalry rank over a lieutenant of the Duke of Warburton's own guards? The lieutenant does have something of a point. There's no provision for this sort of thing. You could perhaps have him removed on grounds of mental instability, but that would require a surgeon, and regrettably, no healers are present. You look around to see that some of the other Lancers have gathered around, attracted by the sound of their commander's outburst. If you plan on convincing them to accept your command, you will have to make your argument quickly. I'm a better soldier and a better fighter. Yeah, not this time around. I'm better educated, and thus I'm more likely to come up with a workable plan. I, I don't know if I should say that. I'm a better leader. I do have two medals, so maybe I can get away with that. Let's see. You stand straight and look down imperiously at the other officer, your eyes peering eagle-like down your nose at him as if he were the subordinate and you the superior officer. You're mistaken, sir. If you think rank entitles you to some sort of divine power over these men, ah, excuse me. You are mistaken, sir. If you think that, that rank entitles you to some sort of divine power over these men, their lives are at stake and it is their prerogative to choose their own salvation. Karakort's men begin gravitating towards you as you continue to speak. The other officers begin to look more and more panic. Within a minute, no one remains on his side. The lieutenant himself is red with rage. You see your opportunity to seize control. You take it. Lieutenant Karakort, you are relieved of command. Gentlemen, tie this officer to something solid and we can see about getting you all out alive. Two of the Lancers immediately comply. Karakort sputters a little, but offers no resistance. See, this is the one, this is, a, once again, this is an example of one of the things I like about choice of games, is that you can feel like you have a personality. Like, that was one of my biggest things that I kind of hated about the life and suffering of Sir Bronte, is that, like, you never, and, and again, it's kind of a, a, a coin toss when it comes to these games, but I never really felt like I had a personality. And even when I made certain decisions, I never really felt like I'm like, I felt the actual decisions or whatever. So they, you, it was very rare when something happened and then you kind of felt what was going on and you really kind of had that, you know, emotional, I guess, grasp to it, I guess you can say, but it, it was rare. It happened but it was very rare. Whereas like in this game, you know, if you say you finna say some shit to some people, you finna say some shit to some people. So, and you're probably going to end up liking it because they, they, the writers tend to do a very good job. Now I've played some games that are really terrible when it comes to the writing. As far as the choice of games go, I've played some very bad ones. Some ones that I really didn't expect to be bad. Um, yeah, hero rise. I'm looking at you, but 
for the most part, they you can feel the weight of the choices that you make and you can really kind of feel the scenes and stuff and you really get an idea of who your character is and you feel like that character. So anywho, enough of that rambling. Let's continue. With the issue of command finally settled, you and your newly acquired men take to the defensive position in preparation for the next Antari attack. Sure enough, in less than half an hour, you begin hearing the crack of musket fire coming from the trees around you. The Antari approach in a long, ragged line. Most wear little but humspun and carry nothing deadlier than improvised weapons made from farm implements. A few, sho a few shoulder muskets and blunderbusses in a most unprofessional manner. At their head stands a man in a red surcoat, legs and arms covered in plate. In his hand, he carries a long, exquisite crafted musket, shining with the blue light of Banecraft. Perhaps he is a, pre a, a petty noble leading his peasants in some futile resistance, or the elected head of a band of freeholders with a hodgepodge of scavenged weapons. It is certainly clear that this little war band is not a particularly professional force. The attackers halt at 80 paces. The musketeers run forward, weapons in hand. The lancers open up on them. Two or three go down. Hitting a moving target at such a range is a difficult task for infantry, let alone cavalry unused, unused to firing from beyond 20 paces. Your own dragoons have better luck. The sharp crack of your men's carbines join the duller cacophony of the Antari muskets and the lancers' pistols. Three more attackers fall. Most of the remaining Antari hurriedly scramble back to their lines as soon as they fire. Their poorly aimed balls fly wildly. Only their leader stands firm, ignoring the bullets flying about him. He coolly levels his weapon and unleashes the bane spell in rune within. There's a loud boom, more like a sound of a cannon than a musket. You see a storm of lead shards issue from the flaming muzzle of the Antari rune gun scything through the air like shrapnel. One of the lancers go down, his brains shredded by a dozen flying fragments. Another falls, clutching the bloody ruins of his left arm. Beyond the smoke, you hear a loud yell from the throats of three dozen men. Dark shapes appear through the powder smoke and coalesce into silhouettes of armed men. The Antari bursts out of the battle fog in a dead charge. The fight lasts for an hour. The Antari charge your men again and again, only to be driven back by by concerted fire, leaving one or two of their fellow fellows dead behind them each time. The enemy finally relents as the sun begins to set. You can see their campfires in the trees as they rest in preparation for another day's fighting. You're safe for now. As you and your men sit down to your own meager rations, your sergeant sits himself down next to you, a worried expression on his face. I've just taken count, sir. And that last little fight used up almost all the ammunition we brought with us. Only the extra cartridges you decided to bring with us remain. Doesn't make our situation much better, though. Those surplus rounds will only last us maybe another day or two. We need a plan now. Before you can call for a meeting, Lanzarill turns to you again. Oh, yes. When you told us to be prepared for anything, I thought you were putting the men on edge for no good reason. But ever since we ran into, those, into this damn mess... He pauses for a moment, grasping for words. The men trust your instincts now. Don't let them down. Okay. So does that mean I get a bonus with them, perhaps? Oh, yeah, I got a little bit more loyalty. So, yeah, I got 5% loyalty there. All right. After dinner, you call your men, dragoons and lancers, both together to, form, to, ah, together to formulate a plan. You see several options available, none without some risk. First, you could attempt a frontal assault. With the Antari demoralized and battered by the afternoon's battle, now would be the best time for it. In such a battle, the forest would give the Antari an advantage, and running out of ammunition might prove fatal in such a circumstance. It is a risky approach and one that relies on your abilities in direct combat more than anything else, but is also the most straightforward. Secondly, your dragoons could stage a diversion, a diversion and gain the Antari's attention while the Lancers escape through the forest. If you are confident in the skirmishing skills and spirit of your dragoons, as well as your own ability to think quickly, this would be an attractive, if risky, plan. Lastly, you could attempt to bluff the enemy into leaving. This plan is probably the riskiest. 
A failed attempt would waste your waste you your precious time and likely boost the spirits of the enemy enough for them to attempt another attack. However, a convincing performance by a man of sufficient personal magnetism would mean victory without further casualties. So I don't think I could have bluffed the Antari because I do remember when I bought um, Thunderer that my charisma wasn't high enough to get a discount, but I did get a saddle with it. Um, so my soldiering isn't very high and I might die if I turn around and actually get into combat. So, but at the same time, I don't want to run. So yeah, I don't want to stage a stage a diversion so they can get away. I'm going to try a frontal assault and I'm going to assume that because they're that they're demoralized and they're tired and we have a professional force that maybe I can get away with it. So let's see. You decide upon the decisive but potentially disastrous option of a full attack under cover of night. You break out the additional ammunition you had brought with you. When the men see the extra supplies of powder and shot, their spirits rise dramatically. You and your men gather in a tight group, taking careful positions around the makeshift gate. Slowly, you push the bundled branches aside whilst keeping a sharp lookout for Antari centuries. Uh, centuries. With the coast clear, the lot of you creep up to the edge of the forest. You sneak up until you can see the flames of the Antari cook fires glittering through the trees. Night blinded by the warmth of their fire, the Antari do not see their death as it approaches them. Two of your dragoons pick out the sentries as, as the edge of the enemy camp. They bring their carbines to their shoulders and take careful aim. Crack. Two carbines speak as one. The Antari pickets crumble, crumple to the ground. Your men give a great cheer and rush forward, picking off targets as they as they present themselves, wreathing the trees in the smoke of gunfire and the screams of the wounded. The Antari regroup with a respectable quickness. Those still standing begin to form up, weapons in hand. As they do, you give the signal to retreat. Your enemies follow your men as they flee headlong towards the listening post. It is only when the enemy bursts from the trees that your men turn and open fire in a mass volley. A half dozen Antari go down in an instant, their red-coated commander among them. The Antari fall back for a moment before attempting to regroup. Without a leader, it takes them nearly half a minute, long enough for your men to reload their weapons. A second volley halts the enemy's uh, the enemy force. There's no need for a third. The Antari hesitate for a minute, then break and run, leaving half their number dead on the field. By the time you look up, the fight is over. The few Antari left standing are running headlong for the deep forest. Those that remain are dead or have already given up. Your sergeant reports with amazement that the battle had been won without a single casualty on your side. When the men realize this same fact, they give a ragged but hearty cheer. Exhausted as they are, they carry you back to the listening post on their shoulders, cheering your name all the while. You all get an excellent night's sleep. Okay, so that, that actually turned out pretty well. Sometimes you have to kind of be careful about the choices because they frame them in a way that makes you nervous. Because like in that particular situation, they framed it in a way where it's like, hey, you know, if you don't have high you know, stats as far as soldiering goes, you might not be able to pull this off. But because you are intelligent and because your men have been properly trained and stuff like that, and because the enemy is actually demoralized and stuff like that, you also had some shot and stuff that made it a lot easier to turn around and pull that off. So that's and, and again, that's another thing about choice of games is that a lot of times it's not a single situation. It is the culmination of a lot of things, a lot of things that make sense, not something that happened, you know, in chapter one, and you never see it again. It's, it's the culmination of a lot of things that led up within a chapter. So, you know, again, I always like the structure of choice of games. There've been, again, I can't think of too many games where the structure just didn't make sense. And I got put in a choice that I didn't like. So anywho, come the morning, you and your men depart to make your report to major Hunter. The Lancers promise to allow Lieutenant Caracourt to resume, resume command, but only after the customary looting and apportioning of the spoils of last, night battle, last night's battle are tallied. 
Magnanimous in victory and grateful for their lives, the Lancer's sergeant promises to send you the lion's share, Lieutenant Caracourt's share, in fact, of the loot. They send you off in grand style with three hurrahs and a saber salute. Your trip back to the main outpost is uneventful. You arrive a few hours before sunset, enough time to shave and get a quick meal before being ordered to report to Major Hunter and Captain Leaf for debriefing. The two grenadier officers seem genuinely surprised by your drawn, your drawn appearance. They had, after all, only expected you to make a simple courier trip. To see you returned after a day of harsh battle must be rather disconcerting for them. Leaf presses you for details, forced dispositions, the equipment of the enemy, the condition of the men you had fought beside, putting it all down in a notebook. Hunter remains silent as his subordinate asks you question after question. This goes on for a good half an hour. You elaborate upon the conditions of your mission, your losses, and your victories. Finally, the captain seems satisfied, putting down his notepad and giving a brusque nod. Now, it is Major Hunter's turn. Leaning forward, he appraises you silently for a moment. His face breaks into a grim slash of a smile. He places his hand on your shoulder, the same way your father used to when you were little. Cornet, what you did out there was beyond anything expected of you. You are truly a credit to your regiment and to His Majesty's army. However, I do have one matter on which I greatly desire your opinion. Knowing a serious question from your superior when you hear one, you lean in earnestly. We've had, we have had negative criticism about Lieutenant Caracourt in the past, but your report makes him out to be entirely unsuited, unsuited for command. Would you support that assessment? It is clear that the major holds your opinion on this matter in high esteem. You come to the realization that your response and by extension, Major Hunter's report to high command could make or break the man's career. What do you think? Well, hmm. Let's see. Well, um, Caracord is incompetent and a disgrace. I would much like to see his career in tatters. Honestly, I don't care about the man that much, but I do think he's an idiot. So let's censure him. I think that'll be a good middle ground right there. I mean, again, I do think, I do think he's incompetent, but, and he's obviously a noble, but yeah, that, that might be a little too far. Plus, I might need his help later on. So let's just go with the censure. Your response is critical, but not overly cruel. Your assessment does not show the lieutenant in any kind, kindly light, but it does mention each of his faults and mistakes in a clinical, impartial manner. In the end, it is a relatively merciful assessment, though you cannot help but conclude with your own low opinion of the man. The lieutenant, in my opinion, is unsuited for command. Perhaps he will still be of use elsewhere. Perhaps he may win promotion through some work away from the battlefield. As he stands now, he should not be trusted with the command of any unit in the field. <laughs> Jesus. Your superiors accept your assessment calmly. Over the next few days, they take the time to inform you that the Caracourt, that Caracourt has been transferred home to serve as a clerk in some musty office in Grenadier Square. His post given to a new officer, which your ultimate superiors consider more suited. Whatever you are feeling about the whole affair, you cannot help but think that you have saved the Lancer unit somewhere out there from a great deal of trouble. A few days later, a package wrapped in canvas arrives from the listening post, courtesy of the White Rose Lancers. Inside sits the rune gun, which belonged to the Antari officer, who your men had gunned down outside the branch wall. Accompanying it is a small scrap of parchment with a short message scribbled within. Your share, as promised. WRL, the White Rose Lancers. Nice. The question of what to do with your newly acquired rune gun Rune gun looms large in your mind. Having seen it used to deadly effect in the hands of a trained soldier, it is clearly a very powerful weapon when employed correctly. That being said, such in rune weapons are also extremely valuable, enough so that their sale is only legal when performed by nobility such as yourself. 
after some thought, you decide to, um, I'm going to actually keep the weapon because it does seem very powerful and my soldiering is not great. My soldiering is not great at all. So maybe it'll help improve that. Keep the weapon for myself. You decide to keep the weapon as your personal firearm. You go to the outpost's gunsmith to have the barrel cut down and the grip shortened. After a few days of work, you find yourself with a newly reworked carbine. The next morning, you take it out into the forest and fire off a few balls with it. You return with a satisfied grin, leaving the smoldering ruin of the trunk of a century-old pine tree behind as a testament to your new weapon's power. Okay, so I got a new weapon. Nice. And look at that. Look at that. That gave me a nice 45. So that was a good 15% right there. That's nice. Okay. So, all right. With immediate events settled, you return to the monotony of reserve duty. Always required to be ready, you remain in barracks, drilling, writing, amusing yourself, and generally occupying yourself with the thousand little duties of soldiery, which qualifies you to collect your pay whilst waiting for another great emergency to pull you out your fuge and into action once more. It never comes. Summer turns to autumn. Over the next few weeks, replacements trickle in to replace the men you've lost. Harvest season and the cold rains of the early winter pass without incident. The season of snow, ice, boredom, and disease pass, as it always does, leaving you with no diversions save the occasional cremation of a frozen dead century or a poor fellow carried off by typhus or dysentery. Finally, the winter ends, and, and it is once again time to choose your duties for the coming year. So I'm going to return to patrol duty again. Like I said, I'm going to go ahead and do all of these. I'm not actually going to try and turn around and buy the promotion early. I'm going to try and get my stats as high as possible. So let us return to patrol duty. And I think in this particular case, this will be the flip side. So I'll actually end up doing the one that I did in the previous video. So I'll just skip past all of this. Oh, but before I skip past this, I will turn around and read the, uh, what is it? The state of the war. Let's see what we have here. So I think I have read all of that. Uh, I think I've read. Uh, I'll just start reading right here. Good Lord. There's a lot. <laughs> Okay, a 14,000 strong Antari army advances south from Octobrit, Octobrit with the intent of retaking Naringia. The Duke of Wolfram assembles a force of nine regiments numbering 6,000 men to face the Antari with the intention of isolating individual columns and destroying the enemy by detail. Winter 602. After a 12-day running battle, the last 4,500 survivors of the Antari army surrendered to the Duke of Wolfram's troops. 70 kilometers northeast of Naringia. Thousands of men die on both sides from the bitter winter weather. The Duke of Wolfram makes the decision to bypass the heavily uh, bypass the heavily fortified city of Karingia. As a result, the River Karen is designated the main line of defense on the Western Front. Elements of the Grenadier Guards, the Ninth of Foot, and the White Rose Lancers are dispatched to reinforce the picket forces already present. In spring 603, increased Tiaran presence along the River Karen has led to an increase in partisan activity. Royal Tiaran intelligence reports evidence of a second Antari army being assembled in northwest Antar. In the summer of 603, an army of 18,000 Antari advances south from, from October. Their intention is to retake Naringia. The Earl of Weathern, Deputy Privy Counselor for War, proposes that his Tiaran Majesty offer the Antari favorable peace terms coupled with the payment of a faith-saving level of war reparations. The proposal is dismissed out of hand. In the autumn of 603, ooh, excuse me, the Duke of Wolfram successfully forces the Antari to divide their army into three parts all of which are destroyed by Tiaran forces over a period of two weeks. Jesus. Now, it's kind of amazing that, like, we have a significantly smaller force. They're outnumbering us pretty much every single time, but we're destroying them every single time. And I think a lot of it does come down to basically peasants fighting and also the fact that they don't have a real leader. They don't have a real structure. So 
because they don't have a structure. It's just the Congress leading people and the Lord's leading people who don't want to be led and who don't really care about what's going on. They do care about their homeland. It's kind of making things a little bit difficult. So, and they're just getting annihilated left and right. All right. But yeah, I think this is actually going to go ahead and go back into what I was doing before. The planning office stands in the center of the outpost's command building, a large room with a stone foundation and a massive map table in the center. It is the closest thing that the outpost has to a central meeting area or ward room. It is here that you've been ordered to report to receive your patrol orders. A pair of grenadiers with loaded muskets and fixed bayonets guard the door at all times, protecting the room and the valuable maps, reports, and classified files stored within. As they see you approach, both snap to attention and take a moment to ensure that you are indeed who you say you are before stepping aside to allow you entrance. So yes, that's exactly what happened last time. Again, I will skip through this chapter. I'm going to be making pretty much the same decisions. If something changes, I will let you know at the end of this. All right, we are back, but now we have a bit of a situation. So unlike the last time, well, we didn't have to worry about you know, talking to Major Hunter about what actually happened. But now we do have the option of telling Major Hunter what actually happened. Um, and I'm of two minds about this. On the one hand, I am ruthless and I don't care about it. However, on the other hand, I don't want to get caught in this dude's mess. I really don't want to turn around and end up, you know, getting screwed out for promotion or anything like that because of this dude like I, it's it's not worth it so um i'm going to uh hmm well then <laughs> let's see i think i'll go ahead and tell major hunter normally i would keep quiet about this but i don't want to lose the success that i've had and possibly not get promotion um and i don't know how bad it gets but i do know that i think that you can i think there's one Thing. If you mess it up, you can become like, you know, a disgrace. Basically, I don't know how bad it gets. I don't know if you actually lose or anything, but I, I think one of the achievements is like national disgrace or something like that. So or a, a disgrace or something like that, your reputation in tatters, whatever. But uh, I'm going to tell Major Hunter about what's going on. So because, again, I don't want to screw up my stuff. The next morning, you tell Major Hunter everything you know. He calls for Captain Leaf to confirm the story. The captain's face goes livid with betrayal and rage as he sees you when he reports in. With all due respect, sir, this toy soldier is merely spinning stories in the wind in some vain attempt to destroy me for some perceived slight. His report reeks of the falsehood and lies which he has so liberally slathered upon his words. You argue your case impassionately in front of the Major. Soon you begin to see him coming to your side, uh, coming to your side to Captain Leaf's increasing anger. Finally, he raises his hand gently to stop you. I think I've heard enough, Cornet. Captain Leaf, your actions besmirch the honor of the King's arms and the noble cause for which we fight. Though I cannot directly offer you any suitable punishment, rest assured that Grenadier Square will know of your foul actions. Leaf says nothing, but you can see his spirit crushed behind his eyes. If Hunter reports him to the Army High Command at Grenadier Square, he would likely be ca cash cashiered in disgrace. Even he, even if he did manage to weather such a charge, his chances of promotion or future patronage would be all but non-existent. You are dismissed, Captain. Get out of my sight. Oh, achievement heaven and earth knows, you know, you expose the atrocities, fellow officer. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Uh, after Captain Leaf leaves the hunter, uh, Lee, ah, after cap, after Captain Leaf leaves, Hunter beckons you to approach his desk. Cornet, I am not a fool. Captain Leaf is an intelligent and vindictive man who will stop at no length to destroy you. You're a good soldier, Draken. We may not agree on our finer points. Can you go away? Thank you. Uh, we may not agree on our finer points of philosophy, but as your actions today have proved, you are still a man of integrity. Oh, you have no idea. I am not. Um, however much you would seem to want to deny it. Tierra has too few men of your sort. I will not suffer Captain Leaf to, dis uh, to destroy your career for your virtues. Major Hunter produces an ornate 
glass flask from under his desk and pours two small glasses of amber liquid. I must ensure that you are beyond the good captain's reach. Tomorrow, I will order you to return to Noringia. My friends in Grenadier Square can work out the reason why later. You will be taking, uh, you will be taking with you a letter of recommendation from myself and a note allowing you to draw on my funds. The major takes one glass and offers it to you. You take it, numb. The major is not only offering you the protection of his powerful reputation, but also the ability to access his considerable fortune. This money will be made available to you for the purpose of purchasing your promotion to lieutenant and, require, and acquiring a higher command within your regiment. Okay, all right. Major Hunter takes the other glass and across the table towards you. Wait, he takes the other glass and across the table towards you. Okay. It is my belief that the Royal Army needs more men like you. To the King and to your success, Lieutenant Dracone. You drain the glass in one swallow. The Kentari whiskey burns its way down your throat. You leave feeling warmer than you have in weeks. All right. So now I'm Lieutenant Dracone. Okay, all right, so that's a good way to end the chapter. Again, it wasn't me trying to be nice. This was just purely me being like, okay, I, I think this dude, he might try and screw me over at some point. And this is one of those situations where I feel like, I, I, I felt like he might try to pull something and I don't want to get screwed. So yeah, because I, I can only imagine that if I turned around and sided with him, then you know, Hunter probably would have just been like, you know, I'm disappointed. I knew about this the entire time and you still did this, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, unfortunately that does make me merciful. Oh man. <laughs> I wish I could change that. I wish I could change that, but, um, I'm going to work on my ruthlessness a bit more, you know, or I might just live with this, but you know, we'll see. All right. Chapter seven. So let us see what the state of the war is right now. All right, what do we have here? Uh, where were we? All uh, right, okay. We're in the summer of 604. The king's request that the court, that the courts add an additional 2 million crowns per annum to the military budget for the purpose of maintaining the Tyrian forces in Antar. The proposal passes, barely. In the autumn of 604, the Duke of Wolfram leads a reconnaissance in force into the central plains of Antar, burning 16 villages and disrupting the harvest in that region. Antarian envoys to the Convocation of the Order's Militant put forward a motion to excommunicate the unified kingdom of Tierra and declare them pariah among nations. Royal Tierran Intelligence reports that Prince Mikhail of Korobirit, the man of Korobirit, Corbirit? Sure. Demanded that the League Congress supply him with the authority to recruit fighting men from the holdings of all Antari lord, Antari lords for the purpose of creating an army to throw the Tierrans into the sea. He receives overwhelming support, but is vetoed by a personal rival. Winter 604. Central Antar is hit by a severe famine thanks to the raiding of Tierran forces. The death toll reaches 75,000 by the beginning of spring. Spring 605, the courts vote to raise a tax on pewter bowls and plates to maintain the war in Antar. The state coffers, having once possessed reserves in excess of 30 million crowns, is now empty. Oh boy. So starting to see problems on both sides. We're going to need some decisive victories on both sides. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny when I saw that about he got, got the, um, what was it? The Antari prince turned around and got vetoed by one person and it was a personal rival and that screwed up everything and it just kind of reminds me of like the senate here in the united states how like one person can turn around and just make it terrible for everyone so joe manchin i'm looking at you but uh um, but yeah like it just kind of reminded me of that like here you have a full-blown war and you know this is something that everyone agrees with but this one dude being a douche could basically screw up the entire country He's the Ted Cruz of the entire country. Anywho, let's get back to the war. All right, chapter seven, wherein the cavalry officer receives a promotion to the rank of lieutenant. You feel the heat from the Duke of Canaris's Banefire Longsword on your neck 
as its razor sharp edge hovers a thumb's width from your exposed throat. You meet your regimental colonel's steady gaze as best you can, acutely aware of the fact that three more swords are also pointed at you from each side and back, each just a step away from putting 20 centimeters of steel through your throat. Canary speaks. You hang on to every word. Do you, Darren de Aldricombe, swear to always uphold the king's law in your service, to maintain the security of the realm and to follow without com compucation, compu compucation, sure, compunction, the orders of his majesty, the king, and those he has placed as your superiors. You hesitate for a moment, but only for a moment. You face far deadlier things than a sword in your face. You steal yourself and quickly regain your composure. I swear by the saints and by my sacred honor. Canaris does not miss a step. Do you, Darren de Audre Cone, swear to protect the person and interests of his majesty the king upon the field of battle? Do you swear to discharge this most vital duty so long as you have eyes to see, legs to stand upon, and an arm to fight with? The answer comes more easily this time. I swear by the saints and by my sacred honor. Do you, Darren de Aldricon, swear to live a life clean in both mind and deed and to serve as an example to those who are bound to follow you? I swear by the saints and, and my sacred honor. Canaris gives a small, knowing smile and withdraws his sword. All around you, you can hear his aides doing the same. Then by the authority of his majesty, King Miguel I of House Rendelware, I hereby appoint you lieutenant in the service of his majesty's Royal Dragoon Regiment. Saints guard the king. All right. Nice promotion ceremony for a lieutenant. You exit the large stone building serving as the Duke of Canaris' command headquarters, feeling no different than you had before. When you were in training, you could not help but look enviously at the lieutenants, at the two shining pips upon their collars, and at the room's at the rooms they got all to themselves instead of having to share. However, now that you have spent some time in service and have earned the f that faithful rank yourself, you realize that all your lieutenancy means is a more ornamental uni ornamented uniform, a larger room and more responsibilities. Worse yet, you have not yet been given consideration for a command. After all, leading a patrol is work for a cornet or an NCO, not a lieutenant. You had to leave your old unit behind when you left Major Hunter's outpost from Naringia two weeks ago. They seemed genuinely distressed at your departure, and every single man came up to wish you luck. You spend the afternoon and evening being fitted for a new uniform bearing the silver tower and two gold pips of a lieutenant of horse. Unlike enlisted men, who must make do with the often ill-fitting issues of assigned uniforms, as an officer, you are expected to pay for a new uniform as part of the cost of your commission. As such, your new tunic and trousers have been made to fit you by a tailor residing in Naringia specifically for that purpose. After a few hours of fitting and alterations, your new uniform is complete. To your pleasure, it fits you perfectly. It is now past sunset. You are most exhausted. The, you remember the way before, ah, you remember the way back to the officer's billets well enough now, and the intervening time and substantial garrison have considerably improved the conditions at night in Naringia. As you cross town in the darkening gloom, your thoughts turn quickly to your new promotion. You now float in an uncomfortable limbo, for you are too senior to command a patrol and still too junior to be given command of a troop currently led by a more experienced officer. Your only hope is to be given a newly formed unit or to replace an officer killed in action. Honestly, you have no idea what your next posting will be. The entire future of your career is up in the air, relying entirely on the whim of his grace, the Duke of Canaris, and of course, the boffins at Grenadier Square. How do you feel about that? Um, Requesting a promotion was a mistake, but I didn't request one, so there's that. I'm uncertain. Having a field command made it much easier for me to win merit and plunder. Now I'm without a command and I have no idea when I shall get a new one. Perhaps your opinion will be vindicated in the days to come. Then again, perhaps not. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. <laughs> Only the moon and stars remain in the sky by the time you get to your quarters. 
Stopping a moment to allow the sentries at the door to verify your identity, you are led to your room by an enlisted man stationed just for that purpose. You warily strip off your old cornet's uniform and place your new, neatly folded lieutenant's jacket and trousers in your wardrobe. Soon, you will be moved to a larger room more befitting your improved station in His Majesty's Army. For now, you are perfectly content to fall into your bed and drift silently into sleep. The next day, you dress in your new uniform. Hard in your throat, you report to the regimental headquarters for new duties. Unfortunately, no new field commands are available. Your new assignment is to the Duke of Canaris' staff. Normally, that would mean that you would be required to help maintain the administrative duties of the regiment, to shuffle reports and bring the most important request to His Grace himself for his consideration. In reality, with squadron and troop commanders handling their own paperwork, your new post effectively sets you, to, sets you at liberty. Over the next week, you quickly learn that, save for a re requisite check-in check -in every morning, your actual duties basically involve sitting at your cramped desk and watching your regimental commander read Kian philosophy and write letters to his family. Your posting seems little more than an excuse for His Majesty's Army to keep you on hand until real work comes up. None of the other desks seem occupied, save for maybe a few in the very early morning. On the sixth day, the Duke finally takes you aside. Lieutenant Dracone, I assure you, there's no need at all for you to waste away your youth waiting on me. Canaris' expression is a mix of pity and bemusement, like what you would expect of a kindly uncle. Go on, I set you at liberty. I'm sure there is something else you would rather be doing. With your entire day freed by your regimented commander's orders, you suddenly find yourself with more free time than you have ever had since you joined the army. Without a unit to maintain or the immediate threat of combat to demand constant readiness in mind or equipment, you stand at a crossroads regarding how to spend your days. A few options present itself. First, there's an officer's club, which has remained exactly as it was on your first visit to Noringia. For the garrison of some 1,200 men, the town offers enough fellow officers to provide tolerable company. Most use the time to gamble away their pay at the constant gains of Tassin's sword. Some extra funds could be won on the side if your skills are good enough. In addition, you learn of a rather crude but well-maintained training grounds outside the town walls proper, which the garrison uses to maintain drill, maintain drill discipline and train up new arrivals. While you no longer have a unit to train with you, your own skills could always use improvement. There's also genuine advantage in remaining at your post in the, regimented off in the regimental office. With little other company, you could ingratiate yourself with your regimental colonel. After all, the Duke of Canaris is a wealthy and vastly influential man. He, or those who might come to you to petition him, might prove most useful acquaintances in the future. Lastly, you could deal with the fact that you still have very little comprehension of the language of those whom you are fighting against. For a small fee, you could hire some local to teach you the rudiments of the entire language, uh, the entire tongue, which might prove useful in the future. After some deliberation, you decide to, well, I don't want to gamble because that could turn out bad. It was different the first time I did it, but now that, that might turn out bad and I could lose some money. Um, I don't really want to focus that much on my mind because, I mean, as far as the the actual soldiering goal. I'm not gonna focus that much on that because that's probably going to be the weak trait that I have and I don't wanna be completely balanced. So um, I'm gonna remain at the Duke's service to ingratiate myself and maybe that'll help me with my charisma and stuff. So yeah. And I asked, and I also didn't wanna pay any money to turn around and do the Antari language thing. So you decide that whatever leisure you may get out of the leaving, get, get out of leaving early is not worth the social capital you could accrue by remaining in the service of your regimental commander. Although his grace seems a little annoyed by your persistence at first, after a few weeks, he finally begins to warm up to you. He begins trusting little tasks to, you, to your hands, bringing him his morning tea, running letters down to the docks, simple things. However, for the rest of the time, you remain at your desk, waiting on emergencies or crises which never come. By the time you have been by the time you have been the Duke's staffer for a month, you've realized two things. Firstly, that there are extended periods of time when the Duke seems even more bored than you are. 
Though it would probably be a great breach of discipline, it would be possible at times to engage in some profitable conversation with your regimental colonel. The second discovery is one that might reap more concrete rewards. You have found behind your desk a set of handsomely bound classic, classic texts on a variety of topics, tactics, philosophy, politics, and the natural sciences. Each seem to be marked as part of His Grace's personal library, and a few are so rare that you've never seen their like before. Should you ask, you are sure His Grace would allow you to pursue them. I mean, to peruse them. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the books. That should help me with my intelligence and maybe my charisma, possibly. What did that do? Well, my intellect is a 61. My reputation is a 61 also. My charisma is a 50. Soldiering is 45. So, yeah, I, I can live with that. All right. The Duke seems delighted that you have taken an interest in his private library. Ooh, excuse me. You may read anything there which... Uh, takes your interest, Lieutenant, he says, a surprisingly unrestrained smile on his face, so long as you handle them with the greatest of care. It is rare enough when a junior officer yearns for a return to study. Those who do, in my opinion, are the ones who will prove wisest in times of great crisis. Over the next few months, you eagerly devour tome after tome, too rare or obscure to have been found in your father's study at home. The Duke is apparently an eclectic reader, and you find your knowledge expanded from every angle. Little more than a year after your promotion, you report to the Duke only to be informed of some rather interesting news. I am afraid, the Duke says, that I shall not be seeing too much more of you in the future. His face is a mask of some slight regret, but no sadness. The Duke explains that thanks to the Royal Dragoon Regiment's distinguished service, including, as the Duke is none too reluctant to mention, your own, Grenadier Square has decided to increase each squadron size from five to six troops each. This, of course, means that your squadron now has an open field command position. As the senior officer without a command currently serving under, on, under Captain Montez, the honor will naturally be yours. You are to have your own command again. All right, cool. It is the work of a few minutes to confirm your new assignment with the clerks and notaries. You are given receipts and receipts and told to collect the equipment required for the command of 40 men and horses. A great stack heap of schedules, regulations and drill books are placed in your arms. You are told that the first of your men are not to arrive from Tierra for another two weeks. You have until then to ready yourself. Finally, the Duke offers his own parting gift. I'm sure that you would not wish to take command over an entire unit of strangers. Thus, I've spoken with Major Hunter and reassigned your old patrol from the outpost over the River Cairn. They will form the nucleus of your new command, and they should arrive within the next three, that, three days. Ooh, interesting. Sure enough, one evening, sure enough, one evening, two days later, Lanzerill, now wearing the three crown chevrons of a staff sergeant, presents himself before you and your quarters with your men following close behind. As such, you formally recognize them as the first members of 6th Troop, 3rd Squadron, Royal Dragoon Regiment. With all this done, Lansborough pulls you into a rough bear hug as the men give a cheer. Begging your pardon, sir, but we miss you. It'd be a fine honor to serve under your command again. Some desultory conversation breaks out, but the men, obviously uncomfortable inside an officer's rooms, take their leave after a few minutes. Two weeks later, a ship arrives with the first dozen of your men. They are likely the worst soldiers you have ever seen. Oh, that's great. The first inspection proves that however much appreciation Grenadier Square might show for your efforts, it is not enough to send you proper soldiers. You find their carbines to be in abhorrent con condition, their sabers rust-spotted, their uniforms slovenly, and their ability to follow even the most rudimentary drill sequences to be all but non-existent. Worst of all, when you receive their files, you note that the majority of them carry a stamped C next to their, to their names. Your new men are, for the most part, conscripts, usually criminals, given the choice of the king's dam or the gallows. Wonderful. All wonderful. And I can't fight. This might get me killed. When you tell your regimental commander of your situation, Canaris is, is, is sympathetic, sympathetic 
sympathetic, but far from surprised. I'm afraid you'll get no better recruits for the rest of your men. He warns you over a glass of Kentari whiskey. When war broke out, all but the, I mean, all the best men like yourself volunteered. The financiers were thrown into a panic by old King Edmund's death. They began hoarding their coin instead of spending it, and those who counted on their custom suffered for it. That meant a great host of honest, hardworking folk took up the king's arm to feed their families. Now those good men are dead or already in service. We've not but the women, the children, and the dregs of society left, and even the best of that scum is being skimmed off by the admiralty. I'm afraid this is all we've got left, my boy. The duke puts a great boar-like hand on your shoulder, his eyes meeting yours in a steady gaze. A warning, lad. Those rats won't dare raise a hand against you in Naringia, not with a thousand armed, honest men around them. But the second you lose sight of the walls, they may turn on you. I'm keeping your troop in reserve until an emergency arises. Use that time to make sure that your men will not disgrace the king's colors when they are finally put to the, to the touch. Canaris swills around his glass for a moment. Perhaps he thinks his words have been too harsh. You've a good lot of men from your last command. Use them. With that last piece of advice given, the two of you down your drinks. His grace dismisses you with a simple good luck. It takes another month for the rest of your men to arrive and another week on top of that to get them mounted and properly billeted. With Captain Montez and the rest of your squadron on detached duty with the Duke of Wolfram's army, you effectively have free reign to put your new command into fighting trim, which is a fine thing as drastic measures are quite obviously needed. All of your new men are as bad as the first batch. Discipline is deplorable. The men's weapons and salary are in a frightful state, and perhaps worst of all, they all seem to resent you as nothing more than a lordling like the ones back home. You doubt that any would follow your orders under pressure. You know full well that the first thing you must do is appoint new corporals and sergeants to command the individual's the individual six-man patrols, which constitute your unit. While Staff Sergeant Landro will return to his previous post as your senior non-com, the other slots must be filled. How do you appoint your new non-coms? Uh, I picked the biggest and most dangerous looking man. <laughs> yeah, that'll get me killed quickly. Uh, I picked those who seem the most literate and well-spoken. Uh, they will ambush me. I picked the most popular man. They would talk badly about me and get me killed. I picked the men from my old patrol. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a 45 loyalty wise. Isn't it? Oh, it's a 40. Great. Um, well, they, they, they should be loyal to me still. You promote the Dragoons from your last command to non-commissioned rank. While the new men grumble at first, the battle-hardened veterans soon assert their dominance with stories of your previous actions. Advice given by long years of experience and a judicious application of the riding crop. The men begin to warm up to their non-coms. Somehow, your new command seems less of a desperate case than it was just a few days before. That was also the advice that um, the Duke gave me as well. I probably should stop moving my legs around before I mess around and unplug something over here. All right. With the non-coms appointed, you can finally set to the work of turning your unit of thieves, rogues, gutter rats, and beggars into a proper fighting force. As it stands, the men are reasonably disciplined, dispirited, and don't resent you overly much. What do you work on first? Um, Staff Sergeant, what's your advice? It's your choice, sir. The old sergeant seems non-committal. If those dregs are the best we've got, then any work on them would be an improvement, bullet to the brains included. Just remember that if you work them to distraction on one task, something else will suffer. So I suggest you not concern yourself overly with just one thing, lest the others slip. Uh, discipline. Let's, let's do the discipline. It worked well for me last time. So discipline. You run your, your new men through the drill manuals, slowly at first to make sure they have the rudiments of the king's manual of arms, then faster and faster until they are able to load, present, uh, fire, reload, dismount, mount, and perform a handful of the other common actions without even thinking. After a few months of constant practice and improvement, you think they might even turn out to be a proper, ah, they might even turn out to be proper soldiers. Unfortunately, the constant drill does not overly endear you to the men you are running ragged. 
being berated by sergeants and ordered around by an officer from drawn from dawn until sunset with time for little else does not do the men's spirit much good. So what is the men's spirit right now? It's still a 20, uh, but their loyalty is high too. So there's that. So uh, maybe I can increase the morale later on. Let's see. Months pass and the falling leaves and cold rains herald the beginning of the cold season. Like the rest of the enlisted men held in, in town, the dragoons are to be moved to winter quarters inside the city walls as maintained and paid for by the army. As a courtesy, you are allowed to inspect them beforehand. They are, in a phrase, the worst, <laughs> the worst lodgings you have ever seen. The floorboards are rotting. The thin and lumpy beds are packed with insects, termites, and fest the timbers. There's no chimney, and the only windows open downwind and of an exposed latrine pit. You have no doubt that should your men be forced to lodge here, they will be far from pleased. You decide that there, these are the lodges provided. My men shall have to bear with it. Surely I can intercede on my men's behalf and find some better quarters for them. If the army refuses to house my men properly, I shall have to rent for, rent better for them myself. How much money do I have? Oh, I have quite a bit of money. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I'll get some better lodgings. I don't want to turn around and have them kill me in my sleep. So there's that. It costs you half a year's pay, but you are able to find a set of, of very nice townhouses abandoned in the initial siege and now owned by a colonel of foot and his staff currently encamped elsewhere for the winter. The men take well to the warm, comfortable lodgings and go through the winter in fine style. The troop finishes the winter healthy and well rested with a greater appreciation for your ability to lead them. Unfortunately, it also gives you a reputation for spoiling your men. A bad one to have in hard service like the army, but for the increased morale and loyalty of your dragoons, it's well worth the price. Okay, so my reputation went down a little bit there, but even still, I mean, that boosted the morale up a little bit. The discipline has went up as well, and the loyalty has went up as well, so I shouldn't have to worry about those now. Okay. Spring brings with it a renewed vit vitality of sorts, with the men... While the men throw into their drills and evolutions with more vigor, they also seem to have the unfortunate habit of working out their energy through less acceptable outlets. One afternoon, you are interrupted by Staff Sergeant Lanzerill. He has brought one of your common dragoons with him. With them are two burly line infantrymen with provost armbands and a man in the garb of an Antari freeholder. Despite his inability to speak your language, the farmer manages to communicate through, uh, through with rough hand gestures, the message that he has some sort of grievance against your dragoon. The Antari farmer attempts to communicate through a rough pantomime. After a few undignified minutes, you seem to grasp his message. It appears that your dragoon has broken into the man's farm and stolen one of his pigs without permission. Your subordinate, of course, denies everything. Why would you steal a whole ass pig? Why? Unlike Bane-blooded officers like yourself, Baneless enlisted men do not have the right to a court-martial. Instead, any disciplinary action is to be summarily ordered by their unit commander, namely you. What do you do? Hang the man. Examples must be made. Have him pay recompense. Uh, six months wage should do it. Jesus. A light punishment would be best. Have the guilty man on stable detail for two weeks. Do nothing. I will not take the word of an enemy over that that of one of my own men. I ask my staff sergeant for advice. Lanzerill? Stop his pay, says Lanzerill without more than an instant's thought. Nothing more dear to an honest ranker than his pay. Six months should do well enough. Half a year of being sober and with only his wit and charm to catch skirt. Well, that'll be a lesson he won't forget, sir. I like Lanzerill. Uh, I really like Lanzerill. You know what? Now that I think about it, I think there is only like one playthrough I actually have where I didn't pick Lanzerill. And I don't even remember that playthrough. Every other playthrough, I've always picked Lanzerill. Okay. So, yeah, have him pay recompense. Six months wages should do it. Your man's face falls in dismay as he hears your verdict. 
Six months pay is a substantial sum for a man of his poor station. He is sent away to his duty sullenly as one of the, the provost fetches a clerk to note down the punishment. When you communicate the message to the farmer, he seems to be content with your decision. There is no doubt that the men find your punishment a little harsh, after all. For a common soldier, no pay means no alcohol, no spending money, and no way of otherwise amusing themselves. However, your reputation among your fellow officers improves as word gets around. Men of your own social class seem to consider your actions as a harsh but fair judgment. Discipline improves slightly, though the men are not quite so ready to follow an officer who has proven himself a martin a martinet. The hell is a martinet? I know it's an insult, but what the hell is a martinet? A martinet? Okay, so everything seems okay. I mean, my discipline is still really high. The morale is still at thirty, and my loyalty only went down by five percent. So not bad, not bad at all. My reputation is fine, also now. The year passes without incident. The men seem to finally be getting used to life as a part of a larger army. Although they are still stuck in Naringia on reserve duty, they have begun to train of their own initiative. Familiarity with your style of command in each, of, in each other has bred both confidence and some small shreds of loyalty in these former thieves, gutter, rat, uh, gutter rats and thugs. Only the challenging seasons and the constant news from a front not quite 200 kilometers away keep you apprised of the passing of time. The army seems to be locked into a state of constant stalemate with the Antari foes. The League Congress armies camp on the southern edge of the Central Plains, ready to destroy any Tierran force that marches out of the forest. Meanwhile, the Duke of Wolfram's regiments remain in the forest around Naringia, snapping up the ad hoc force of any Antari Bane Lord foolish enough to send his men into the firmly Tierran held forest. As the new year begins, Noringia begins to buzz with more than a normal crop of political conjecture and a personal gossip. And personal gossip. Rumor begins to spread that some hot headed Antari lordling is gathering an army to throw the king's forces into the sea. Not only that, but it is said that this that his army would be bigger than any previously faced, and that the north has been stripped bare of fighting men to fill its ranks. Even more excitingly, it is said that the Duke of Wolfram is gathering a substantial number of the king's regiment to not only throw back the impending Antari offensive, but to do so in a way as to end the war by the autumn harvest. One summer day, as you approach the entrance of the Duke of Canaris' office to hand in your weekly reports, you see another man stumble out of the door. He wears the gray, green, and red of your regiment and the three gold pips of a captain on his, so on his shoulder. He seems in in a fearful state. Aside from his conspicuously new tunic, his uniform is splattered with the dust of hard riding and what appears to be dried blood. As you approach the officer to greet him, you recognize him with a start. He is none other than Elson. So yes, our mate back in, um, well, school or whatnot at the time, Elson. He's finally got himself a, a nice little captain's rank, little bastard. But uh, yeah, we've now ran into him. And I think I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. And in the next episode, we'll see what Captain Elson has been up to. Some bull. How come I'm not a captain yet? But anyway, yeah, we'll go ahead and see what he's up to. And we will continue on with this story. And, you know, see how things turn out. So far, it's turning out pretty well. You know, it's unfortunate that I did lose those saves. But uh, it's turning out pretty well so far. I have a lot of money. I'm a lieutenant. You know, my stats are actually pretty decent this time around. And I don't have soldiering stats that did not help me <laughs> at all. So, yeah, it actually is turning out pretty well. So I'm actually liking this right now. I do wish I was more ruthless. And I guess I could just edit that. Um, but I will probably just leave it like it is. But... If you want me to edit these things, let me know in the comment section. It's not that actual, actually that hard, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think I've ever actually edited a choice of game before. Um, I usually just play like the modded versions of it or whatever. But I've never actually edited this uh, these type of games before, so I'm not sure how it actually works. 
I do know in most cases that like, you know, you can turn around and play with it without too much happening. I've only played one game, which actually, I actually kind of screwed me when um, I played a modded version of it, but, and it was more so funny than anything else. But yeah, like I, I, I could probably still figure it out. I'm pretty sure there's a guide or something online I could find. But yeah, let me know if you want me to edit that ruthlessness to 100 or any other stats you would like for me to edit. I would be more than happy to edit any stats. But anywho, thank you for watching the video. If you liked the video, you know, leave a like. And if you want to see more content like this, subscribe. I have a lot of things on the channel and I have plenty of other things planned in the future. It's been a little hard for me to do all the stuff that I wanted to do this week because work has been really tough. And on top of that, I have to work this Saturday. So that has kind of screwed the pooch. But um, I do still plan to record Sunday and hopefully I can turn around and uh, finish Sabres of Infinity. And if I can finish Sabres of Infinity this Sunday, then I can turn around and start recording some other things. Like I said, I would like to at least do a video of Colony Ship. I would like to do um, Disco Elysium just to see, you know, as far as the views go and stuff like that to see if there's any interest in it or anything like that. And, um, yeah, I would at least like to put that out. And, um, I even might, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about also doing another episode of, um, Lakeview, uh, cabin too, as well. Uh, just kind of playing around with it and seeing what, seeing, seeing what I can find out. I know there was a couple comments that actually left a lot of tips in there. So I would like to actually kind of explore that and see, what I can uh, find out and what we can kind of play around with. But I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm not going to actually jump into it again until the actual full release of episode two, because for right now, you know, things are kind of the way that they are with it. It's, it's a beta, so it's kind of limited right now. But anywho, um, yeah, I will see you in the next video. And like I said, let me know if you want me to play around with these stats again. I can figure it out. It wouldn't take much, but uh. If you want me to leave it like it is, then I can leave it like it is. But if not, I can edit the ruthlessness and I can edit whatever else. I can make my character a god if you want. I can make my character the richest mofo on the face of this earth. But um, yeah, you know, it's whatever. It's it's nothing. So I was actually kind of thinking about doing a playthrough like that anyway, where I was just in complete god mode and I can pretty much do whatever I want to. I love playing those type of, you know, characters or whatever. Because sometimes, you know, you just don't want to actually sit there and try and, you know, min max everything. You just kind of want to just have, you know, an overwhelming playthrough where you play out your fantasy as a God. And that's typically what I do in my spare time. But, uh, but yeah, just let me know, um, what you want me to do there. So I will see you in the next video and I hope you did like this video. See you in the next one. See you.